Well, hey guys, and welcome back to Maine Fish and Wildlife for a fully remote Wednesday uh, reading and reflection assignment here. Uh, generally in Maine Fish and Wildlife class, when we used to have early release days uh, once a month, on those days we would do some reading and reflection. And, and uh, with reading and reflection in this class, we're generally uh, going to read from my favorite book of all time. And that book is called A Sand County Almanac. I want to show you this book right now. It's written by a very, very famous conservationist. In fact, um, uh, maybe some say the most famous conservationist, the godfather of conservation here in North America, a guy by the name of Aldo Leopold. And uh, he, he wrote this book, A Sand County Almanac. It's a collection of short stories um, uh, and some of his drawings. And the coolest part about a Sand County Almanac is these short stories are organized by months of the year. And he uh, is often writing about his home in Wisconsin, in, in the Sand Counties of uh, Wisconsin, where he had the shack that he lived, and he was just a real cerebral dude. And you'll see the way he thought about wildlife and, and uh, wilderness is, is really amazing and way, way ahead of his time. This guy would wake up in the morning, drink his coffee and watch the sunrise and listen to the birds wake up and keep a log of the birds that he heard and when. And that's kind of what our first story we'll read today is about. One of the coolest things is he's writing about, uh, you know, Wisconsin, which has very similar climate and wildlife to Maine. So in many ways, as we go through the year reading these short stories each month, it's going to feel like we're reading about Maine. And, and that's one of my favorite parts of this book. I remember this was the very first textbook I had to buy as a freshman wildlife ecology student at the University of Maine. I remember going to the bookstore and grabbing this little thing off the shelf and saying, this is my textbook for the class? And uh, how fitting, what a great book and what a great way to enter uh, this, this world of, of conservation and wildlife management. So let's jump in and let's read a little bit. Uh, let's read a short story from September in a Sand County Almanac. Um, and let's take a look here. I have this saved in iBooks. Uh, the short story we're going to read today is called A Coral Copse. And generally the way this works is we'll read a short story together. And from there, you guys will break out and you'll do what I call a reading and reflection assignment. And on these assignments, um, you're going to have a few questions to answer. And then you'll do a brief little reflection, a Collins Type 3, in complete sentences where you'll answer a few FCAs. So that's how this will all work. Let's jump in and think about our reading. Um, now, keep in mind, most of these short stories we're going to read are written in like the 1930s and 40s. Uh, the vocabulary he uses can be a little tricky to like uh, decipher, and I often have to stop and think about what he's getting at after each paragraph. And I may do that as we read. We may stop and try to talk about kind of exactly what he's getting at. And uh, he's he he paints a beautiful picture with words here uh, as he thinks and reflects on wildlife. So let's jump right in and read the Coral Cops by Aldo Leopold from a Sand County Almanac. He starts by saying, By September, the day breaks with little help from birds. A song sparrow may give a single half-hearted song. A woodcock may twitter overhead and route to his daytime thicket. A barred owl may terminate the night's argument with one last wavering call. But few other birds have anything to say or sing about. What he's getting at there is in the fall, uh, many of the birds are done singing for the year, right? They sing in the spring to attract mates. And in the fall, if you wake up in the morning, it's much, much quieter compared to, you know, April and May when the birds are singing at the top of their lungs first thing in the morning. It is on some, but not all, of these misty autumn daybreaks that one may hear the chorus of the quail. The silence is suddenly broken by a dozen contralto voices, no longer able to restrain their praise for the day to come. After a brief minute or two, the music closes as suddenly as it began. There's a peculiar virtue to the music of elusive birds. Songsters that sing from the topmost boughs are easily seen and as easily forgotten. They have the mediocrity of the obvious. What one remembers is the invisible hermit thrush pouring silver chords from impenetrable shadows, the soaring crane trumpeting from behind a cloud, and the prairie chicken booming from the mists of nowhere, the quail's Ave Maria in the hush of dawn. No naturalist has even seen the coral act, for the covey is still on its invisible roost in the grass, and any attempt to approach automatically induces silence. That word covey is kind of cool. We don't hear it in Maine very often. A covey is a flock of quail. So quail will often flock up on the ground, and we call that a covey. So that's kind of cool. I want to come back, though, to the beginning of that paragraph where he says, There's a peculiar virtue in the music of elusive birds. Songsters that sing from the topmost boughs are easily seen and as easily forgotten. They have the mediocrity of the obvious. What an amazing uh, statement there. 
And that's some deep stuff. And Leop Leopold does this over and over again. Uh, it's, it's a really interesting statement. What I think he's getting at there is that, uh, you know, sounds and things that we don't often hear often stick with us a little better. And I think that, that that is often true with people as well. We all know people out there that are loud and always always kind of giving their opinion or maybe shouting from the rooftops all the time. And they end up becoming background noise a little bit. But those people that don't speak often, but when they do really have something to say, they tend to catch our catch our ear a little bit and then we tend to listen to them a little bit more. I can tell you as a as a former lacrosse coach, we would have captains from all ends ends of the spectrum, and some some were loud and and uh, barking at everybody all the time, and some were uh, very soft spoken. But when they spoke, uh, those guys on the team with them might have might have listened a little closer. So I can totally get what Leopold's getting at there with that peculiar virtue and the music of elusive birds. Just really deep, cool stuff. All right, let's continue on here down bottom. In June, it is completely predictable that the robin will give voice when the light intensity reaches 0 .01 candle power and that the bedlam of other singers will follow in predictable sequence. I can tell you, we'll stop there. I can tell you firsthand in June and in May uh, when I go turkey hunting and I sit in the woods in the dark in the morning and I'm waiting for all the birds and everything to wake up, all the Leopold is spot on. The, the robin is the very first bird to start singing, and they do that as soon as there's a tiny little crack of daylight on the horizon. You'll hear the robin start singing, and it's not long before all the other birds kick in. Let's continue here up top on the right-hand side. In autumn, on the other hand, the robin is silent, and it is quite unpredictable whether the covey chorus will occur at all. The disappointment I feel on the mornings of silence perhaps shows that things hoped for have a higher value than things assured. Oh man, another deep one. I love it. Things hoped for have a higher value than things assured. The hope of hearing quail is worth half a dozen risings in the dark. My farm always has one or more coveys in autumn, but the daybreak chorus is usually distant. I think this is because the coveys prefer to roost as far as possible from the dog, whose interest in quail is even more ardent than my own. One October dawn, however, as I sat sipping coffee by the outdoor fire, a chorus burst into song, hardly a stone's throw away. They had roosted under a white pine copse, possibly to stay dry during the heavy dews. Uh, copse is a small group of trees, so he's got a little shrubby group of pine trees near him that the quail sang from, and, he, and uh, it really, really touched him. And, and he thinks the quail might stay away from his house because he has a bird dog. He's an avid bird hunter, and he's got a, a bird dog that's always running around, and that might be why the covey never really comes close. We felt honored by this daybreak hymn sung almost at our doorstep. However, the blue autumnal needles on those pines became thenceforth bluer, and the red carpet of dewberry under those pines became even redder. So what he's getting at there is that sound in the background changed his experience uh, in entirety, and it changed his entire experience of the outdoors. As he, as he listened to those quail sing, the colors became more rich, and, and it just burned into his memory because, that, the, because of that peculiar virtue in the music of elusive birds. So just a really cool short story, a great way to start the year. It's September. We're already noticing that the birds are singing less, and uh, it's a great way to start to notice the change in the seasons. So here's your job today, folks. You're gonna go uh, uh, in Google Classroom. I have this assignment posted. You're gonna upload this to Notability. And again, you're gonna take care of the Collins Type 2 part at the top. You're gonna answer these questions. Give me three bird species he notes hearing in September. Uh, which one is most predictable in June? We talked about that. Which species song seems the most valuable to Leopold? I think it's obvious through that story, which one he has holds most value toward. And we talked in the story about what a covey actually is. Uh, number five, we may or may not have talked about um, the values of wildlife as you watch this video. So I may help you with it a little bit here. Um, but we're gonna talk about six values of wildlife that people assign to wildlife here. And based on this story, holy cow, I, would, I think it's pretty hard to deny that uh, quail have aesthetic value to Leopold. Uh, he is absolutely um, just in love with the sound of these quail and for sure they have uh, ecological value to him. He loves uh, that scientific kind of uh, study of these quail and monitoring where they are and I would argue probably a little bit of game value as well. He's a bird hunter and he loves to uh, you know 
chase these quail around with his bird dog and he talks in there about how he guesses that might be why the covey doesn't come super close to his house generally so um, if you've already learned about the values at this point uh, in the class there you go I just helped you if you haven't we will get to those values trust me uh, and you guys uh, will understand what I'm getting at there as we get a little closer so the last thing I want you to do and this is maybe my favorite part of these assignments is you're gonna share with me some specifics how did you connect with this story. What do you think Leupold means in the third paragraph? We talked about a little bit where he says, there's a peculiar virtue in the music of elusive birds. Can you relate to that? What's he getting at there? Secondly, give me one passage that relates to your own observations in Maine. Have you ever heard birds singing? Have you, you know, woken up early in the morning and heard those robins? Have you been turkey hunting like me? And did you relate to that, that little anecdote I shared with you? And then identify one way in which this passage has changed the way you look at the Maine woods. So tell me, how are you going to think about and look at the Maine Woods differently in September now, the next time we're out with class? Is it going to change uh, any of that? Are you going to be listening closer to the birds? You tell me. Give me a brief reflection and make sure you touch on all three of those Collins Type 3 FCAs right there. I appreciate you guys tuning in on our Fully Remote Wednesday, and I will see you guys next time in class.